The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Welcome to the Rise Above Show. I am Joe Peroni. And I'm Heidi Mancini. And tell everybody about our sponsors. Well, our first sponsor is uh, Meal Prep Vegas, and they are sponsoring our show. They're partnering with the Rise Above Show. So we want to thank Marie for doing your food prep this time for your contest. And she's also helping out my daughter, Ava Marie. Oh, that's right. She's yeah. done some food Perfect. for her to help her with her fitness goal. So we want to make sure that we um, thank her for sponsoring us. So if you ever if you need some food done, give Marie a call. Um, her number is 702-624-9286, and she delivers it right to your door. So you don't even have to leave your house for it. She'll t come right to your place with your food. So it's nice. And then we want to thank Jay uh, Jung Young of City Athletic Club for sponsoring the Rise Above show also. Perfect. Okay, so this week's show, I had this show planned out, and we were going to have a great guest, but it didn't work out because I think Access Hollywood or something like that came in town, and they had to do some filming, so that didn't work, but that's okay because <laughs> we have plenty of material, and uh, we will make that show work, I believe, next week. Last week's show, we did it on uh, grief and loss. And I gave you some ideas about how that is, at least from my point of view, and how to kind of acclimate that and work it into your life so it becomes a source of your strength rather than this thing that brings you down the rest of your life. So I thought maybe we could continue with that today and see how that works. Our special, other special guest we had last week was Lola. She is not here with us this week, so we'll see how that works. Actually, I, I really enjoyed that with her. It was fun. Because when you were sad or something like that, she would walk over to you. And if I use my hands too much, I'm still very Italian. I, I tend to... She knows. Yeah, you know, I know I'm not that aggressive, but when I watch myself on camera, I seem so aggressive, you know? <laughs> so every once in a while, Lola will come over, I guess, to calm me down. So I, I really like that, too. So it was really interesting to watch that in real time. So I think what I want to do today is continue in that vein and also maybe bring up some things that you have not heard about in, in grief and loss. Because when I look at the therapy model, so to speak, I think they leave a lot to be desired. That's why I wrote my own book on it. But I want to start off with this. I was so honored this week, too, especially from a lot of people, but especially this one person, and I did not clear it with him to use his name, so I won't. But he wrote me something that it had to do, he basically did a synopsis of our show last week of the things that really touched him that could help him in his life. And I thought, well, if one person could really write it this well and put it down in numbers and stuff, then I thought maybe I should share that because he did a better synopsis of the show than I did. Because <laughs> I write a one-page synopsis every week to put on the website, but I think his is better because it came from another human being that was watching the show. So it means a lot more, you know, at least it does to me mm -hmm. that somebody was moved by it. So this is what he, he wrote about last week's show, about the things that were important to him. He said, number one, the amount of grief is proportional to the love that you shared. And we went over that. Uh, number two, honor my mother not by hiding cowardly and running from my emotions, but by living a life that would reflect the things that she has taught me and tried to instill in me. I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. that's so, it's, it's, it's worded better than I did, actually, and I think that's something that's so important. And I'll say it so many times because I feel so strongly about it. So many people, through grief, it's like, okay, there's a certain amount of time that we all need to grieve, and it's respectful, and it's just normal. You have to. But by living a life where you purposely do wrong things, mm. or you don't take care of yourself, it's just no way to honor people. And the way he, he said that was amazing. 
you know, people try to instill in you to the best of their ability the love that they have. And to carry that forward is an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad he said that. Uh, number three, when I'm gone, those in my life will be able to say that I've lived my life and loved as fiercely as I possibly could. And I love that too because I was really trying to instill on people that with having the ability to know what's down the line for all of us, because if we're human, we're going to die, we really do need to care about every moment and be present while it's here. And I try to do that with Heidi every day. Um, actually, I just did it when we left the house. You know, I say goodbye to all the dogs just in case something happens. The last image I want them to have is of me, knowing that they cared. Mm -hmm. So I'm still trying to follow that. Uh, number four. When I lay my head down on my pillow at night, I can rest in the fact that I know I gave each day everything I could. And I think that's important too, because even with addiction or acting bad to other people, acting out or acting inward, you know, doing bad things to you, if you know you're doing everything you could in a positive direction at that moment, that would stop you immediately mm -hmm. from taking the negative route you would immediately move to the positive. So I'm very grateful that he took that. And then he added this. He said, but I'd like to take it a step further. And this is another reason why I'm reading this because other people can help me too. It says, I know that God didn't just create us to live in a world full of pain and suffering and just sit back and watch. And I can't read this other part. But I guess the point would be, is that there's more to life than pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. And he said, God suffered for us for the greater good. And that's one of the things I thought of too, is that how do we get over suffering? And F Frederick Nietzsche said a long time ago, and also Viktor Frankl has also said that, if you give meaning to your suffering, the suffering goes away because it becomes worth it. So in this case, one of the examples that's given, and I've actually worked with some people, and this actually, it, it works very well. If you're dealing with one partner who is grieving the loss of another partner, you say, well, what's the meaning in that? Well, let's look at it like this. What about if the other partner was alive and you were the one who's dead? Think about how much pain your partner would have. So what you're doing, you take away the, the, the suffering by, the meaning is, is that you're gonna have to be the one that carries on the pain of it so your partner did not have to. So I've done But that. I think too, when people suffer through death and grief, I think yeah. whatever your definition of suffering is, um, I think it is a part of growth and I think that we all have to go through it because I think with a certain amount of suffering, as long as you don't hang on to it the rest of your life, right. I think that we all need that to happen to us at some point in our lives to either move us forward the way we're supposed to go, give us a jump start, and it's a reality check on your own life because I know when I watched my father die, mm. um, he was a really vivacious, I've talked about my dad before on the right. show, and to watch him disintegrate into, you know, so much pain, suffering, whatever. I personally, on my level, at that point, it was a turning point for me in a lot of ways because I was, you know, not to make this about religion, but I was very Christian at the time and I don't believe that a, man, a God would make people suffer. So for me, it made me question my life the way I was living it and the relationship I was in at the time. It made me question a lot of things that I was brought up to think about myself and my family and I remember my my dad basically saying to me you know you need to take care of yourself and and live an honorable life and at the time I didn't understand I mean I knew what it meant but I was kind of like yeah he always used to say that so I said you know I would and he said just worry about yourself and your baby and he said don't worry about nothing else he said because when you take care of yourself you'll you'll be able he said don't worry about me you know and I remember him when he died it was a turning point in my life for growth and God had nothing to do with it um, my mother had nothing to do with it my daughter had nothing to do with it my ex-husband at the time had nothing to do with it it had to do with me sitting on the toilet alone with the bed the bathroom door closed crying my eyes out 
and saying, you know, you're not living up to your potential and you need to make some changes. And at the same time, you know, the fear of that, like, what are you going to do? It's like a drug addict or anybody else sitting there looking at themselves going, you know, I know I need to make changes, but now how do I go about it? And we live in a world where I think that there's a lot of talk. You know, I think a lot of people spend a lot of their lives talking about what we need to do, how we're going to do it, it, trying to inspire people by words. And I think as a society, we need to become more active in our care for each other and how we do reach out to each other in a physical way. And we physically reach out and we talk and we touch and we express our love for people that way rather than there's a lot of things on uh, Instagram now and, and Facebook where everybody's posting all these sayings and, you know, whatever it might be about being happy and hopeful and inspirational. <laughs> but, you know, you walk out on the street. I just came in here today and I was walking in and there was two gentlemen arguing out in the parking lot about profit and nonprofit and all this kind of crap. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, they were just in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I was like, you know, this is, okay, but anyway, I mean, I know that's life, and I know things happen, but I think as a, as a culture, we need to start really, you know, like we have a great show, right? And everybody says that they love our material, they love us. They go, we love you guys, you and Joe are amazing. But at the same time, we need help too, to get sure. our stuff out there, and, and in some way, people partner with us in a way where they can, again, spread that, I mean, spread whatever goodness they're getting out of the show and help us so that we can stay doing what we need to do. No, I, I agree. You said so many things. In there I know. That, that I go off on my tangents. No, 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 but no, I love that. I know for me, I know for me personally, <laughs> I, my thing is, is that, you know, you, you, you have to live a certain way. We can talk, talk, talk all day long about, you know, what, what has to be done, what needs to be done, but there's not enough action. You know, it's like you turn on the news now and I don't want to get political, but I don't even listen to TV anymore news. I don't want to hear it. There's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of blah, blah, blah. The same sentences over and over again. Nothing's getting done. Everybody's bashing everybody else. And as a culture in a country, it's perpetuating hate. It's perpetuating negativity. Nobody has a solution. And instead of putting all that energy into all that, how are we going to like complain every minute? Why don't people get out there and do more about True. it? So that's that's my big thing. And I've been trying to make it better for you know, you and I both do. We're both trainers. You have more experience in the field than I do. But we're out there. I'm, I'm doing hair every day. I listen to people. I talk to people. I try to help people. We, we do the show. We do personal training. In a physical way, we're out there every day trying to make a difference in the job professions that we chose. But I see a lot of people out there that they say a lot and they don't do a lot. So, you know, that's, you know, you, you can only have a certain amount, handful of people that are, you know, trying to make a change, make a difference. And it's like all the volunteering agencies that are around town, you know, they need so much help and so many volunteers all the time. And everybody complains about, well, I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that. I don't want money going over there and I don't want this happening. But nobody gives their time. You can't make change if you're sitting behind a desk and you're just saying, well, we all need to do, or you're posting things on Facebook and going, be an inspiration, love your neighbor, do this, do that. And people sit at home on their computers. Yeah. That's not changing anything or on their cell no, phones. You know, it's, it's like, like you said, you said so many things there. I don't even know where to start. It, it's so true. Um, last week, we kind of memorialized the 10 years when I was, became a widower, let's say. One of the things that I noticed right after that was when you're trying to find this new sense of normal, you know, your role has changed, right? I was a husband, then I wasn't, then I was a father, then I wasn't, then I was a family man, then I wasn't. And I'm like, okay, one of the things is, is that we're, as human beings, we are wired for social connection. And me being a family man, and I thought this was a good thing at the time, I really only socialized with my family. So I had my work and family, and I had really no friends. So I woke up one morning, and all of a sudden I realized I have no social life. There's nothing going on. And that's what woke me up to the some of the things that you're saying. And this was already, it's been 10 years. It's amazing. I looked, and everybody had the headsets on when they would walk into the gym. Nobody was talking. They were listening to their own music. And that freaked me out because you're not even listening to the radio anymore to where you can start to hear and accommodate new songs and new sounds into your brain. Everything was, I only want to listen to this song when I want to hear it and only that song and maybe this song. 
So now everybody's closed in. So instead of having this big sponge of a brain, everybody has this like dry brick of a brain. I mean, I, I don't want to be mean, but I mean, I felt so alone is what I was saying. I, I, I mean, feeling back then. Because you can't, it's very, very hard to connect with people. And even on Facebook, we always talk about the social media. There's nothing social about social media. It's making us more distant. And Heidi and I have had this conversation, uh, probably she's heard it, me say it way too many times, <laughs> but, but it still bugs me, is that I've probably spent about $100,000 on part of my college education to become a therapist and to become a helper, only to be thwarted by some people who look up a quote on Mark Twain and they go, you know, be inspirational. And then they have their own little talks, they have their shows, they have their everything out there. They're they branding themselves as these inspirational leaders, but they've done nothing other than steal a couple of quotes from people and they take off their clothes a lot on Facebook and they end up getting all these followers. Well, the thing and is that so people could follow up with I mean, I think it's great if you have a bunch of crusaders out there that believe what they say, they say what they believe, now it needs to be followed up with action. Because I know a lot of the people that do this, and they don't live those lives. I know that for a fact. So all I'm saying when I spoke about it earlier was, it's okay to, to want to make things better, but now you gotta take the next step and you gotta get out there and do it. Once you get out of your ego, and that's the problem with most people, they're in their ego all the time. It's ab about being right, it's about, you know whatever their cause is or whatever their opinion is at the at the moment sometimes you have to get out of your ego and most times people are in their egos and people on Facebook they're in their ego whenever they're posting stuff they're right in their ego you need to get right. out of it and you need to step away from the ego once in a while Well, in my opinion one of the reasons why there's not a lot of action is because a lot of the people that are doing this they don't have any action they're, the only action they have is to look up a quote and all of a sudden they're like Gandhi and I think that's a problem. So to bring this back around to overcoming grief, I would say one of the things that I experienced is, and I don't want other people to experience it, and unfortunately you probably will for a little while, uh, Karl Marx talked about alienation. And part of it is alienation from your community. And that's what I felt, is that I was really alone. And then when you get into social media, you realize if you're actually using your prefrontal cortex, you know, the real part of your brain, you'll realize that they're just putting out quotes and there is no action, so you feel even more distant. And if you're not in the job that you like, you're alienated from the job you're doing because the job that you were maybe built to do inside your heart and soul is not what you're doing out in the real world. And you may have lost your role in life. If you're going through a loss, you already did lose your role. So you're being alienated from all these different directions. So part of it is, is to go back to basics and say, who am I, what do I want, and how am I gonna do this? And unfortunately, or I fortunately, depending on how, how you wanna say it, this is gonna be a really hard road because you can't do it through Facebook. You can't do it through looking at a nice quote on Twitter or whatever. But I will say, let me interrupt you just for one second. Yeah, I think that social media, in one, in, in one sense of it, we have a friend right now that's going through a difficult time with his daughter. She had brain surgery. And I think in, in that situation, when you're in, in social media and you can reach out to everybody and your real friends, you know, whoever your real friends are on Facebook, your social media people, yeah. Yeah. to be able to reach out and say, this is what's going on in my life right now. Can I have your prayers? Can I have you in my thoughts? and to feel like they have community because some people they don't have anybody i mean there's people like you said you felt annihilated when Kay passed away and your kids left and you didn't really you had not extended yourself outside their relationship so maybe at that time if you would have been on facebook or some social networking you would have had more and more people reaching out to you socially whether it's authentic i want to say that most people that are on facebook are authentic and they mean well i don't think you know and we can we can um discern the people that are fake and very narcissistic, you know, and those are the ones that I go unfollow, throw them off, I get rid of them because I don't want to see their naked pictures and their BS. But for this particular person, Rich Allison, he's always supportive of yes. our show. You know, for him, I would have to say, and he was our guest, that in that way, social media, I think, 
helps people out and I also think it helps people that maybe have a secluded they don't have a lot of friends or family and it's a way for them to connect uh, to other people and I think personally too for me it's been a way for me to connect to people outside my circle and I've been able to help people in other states and different areas of the country believe it or not mm -hmm. because they saw my stuff and they've reached out to me and they said you know what do you do about this or what do you and, and it's because of the show too so I've been able to make some friendships outside of Las Vegas and outside of my circle but it also you know I'm discerning too like I can tell a creeper when they're a creeper and you know whatever it is right. but I think in those situations social media if they would have had Facebook when this all happened to you you could have maybe reached out and made some friendships and maybe got more involved in your wellness coaching and things like that I don't know I mean I don't know because since then you and I have done a lot of things together since then right. that I have a lot to do with so I don't know I don't know if do you know what no, I'm saying well, you're right. I, well okay so you corrected me in a good way I think you're you're right there's nothing necessarily bad or good about social media mm -hmm. it's the people it's what you who do are with in it. it it's the people when you find it right so okay so yeah it's like that church would be, that would be a correct way I love I said to somebody I said I love I like religion okay I like spirituality I love all of it whatever you believe in I don't care if it's Buddhism Christianity uh, I don't care what the heck it is. It's great. It's awesome. We all need something that we can give us hope. Mm -hmm. I don't like the people because what the people do is they take whatever that, that spirituality is or the religion and they distort it to what they want it to be. That's right. what I have a problem with. I don't have a problem with the religion. I have a problem with the people that do it. Now you need to act it. Don't yeah. come out of church. Don't come out of your temples and then act like idiots. Yeah, I know I'm going to get this wrong, and John will probably correct me. But John Lennon, when he, <laughs> John Lennon, when he wrote Revolution, it's like, yes, I'm into the revolution. Let's change things. But if you talk about violence, count me out. And that's what he said. He never said, I don't want revolution. He said, yes, I want revolution. Mm -hmm. But you do something here that I don't like, I'm not putting up with it. And going in that vein, I could say, I actually, in my graduate studies, I started off at an evangelical college, Liberty University. And it was an absolutely horrific experience because right off they start saying that gay people caused 9-11, you know, I mean, they were so brutal and actually I had to write a paper and they condemned me. Because of what I talked about last week, and I'll say it like this again, only because people understand it like that. When I had to pull the plug, they were like, you played God? You're not allowed to do that. You're a murderer. I'm like, I had to hear that from a teacher at Liberty University? Listen, I don't have enough middle fingers for you. You can hide behind the Bible all you want. And I'm not saying that that makes it that there is no God. I'm not saying any of that what I'm saying is is that if you have a human being that's representing something you're a human being I don't have to be part of your church I don't have to be part of your religion I don't have to go on Sunday to your place of worship when you're talking about hating people so spirituality and love and caring I'm in you want to talk about hate you want to talk about judgment of other human beings you can count me out and that's one of the things that I found when I was trying to see um, recover from grief and loss. One of the places I went to was church. Mm -hmm. And I found some really awesome, nice people there. It was really good. Uh, I also found a lot of incredibly uh, misogynistic, racist, brutal people that I would never want to be around. So I decided to handle it in my own way. Like that was not the way I want to handle it. I don't need mm -hmm. to do that. You know? But I think what you're saying with the grief thing is that, you know, you need to sit in something for a minute. And I think that's with anything. I think, and the amount that you love somebody, we've talked about that. You know, I was really close to my dad. And so it was a tough thing for me too. I got married too young. I had my dad as like my buffer, you know, most of my life. Hmm. And then when that happened, it's kind of like it pushed me. It's like, it's like anything. You, uh, most people I think at some point hit a catalytic point in their life where they go, I've got to make a change somewhere somehow and I don't care if it's that if it's you're doing drugs you're drinking you're doing whatever you're doing everybody hits a wall mm -hmm. and they go I'm either gonna turn around and I'm gonna do the best I can and make some changes and those changes are tough I mean they're not oh, easy yeah. when people say you know they're gonna make it's hard it's hard to to stick with what 
you need to do to to change it means losing family members sometimes it means losing friendships it means getting a divorce it means you know parting with all these things that you're comfortable with you know it, it means if you're a drug addict it means walk away from all those great friends you think you have that you're also codependent on you exactly. know it means starting over and you know I think that's the point it's starting over and a lot of times people are like I just don't know how to start over well I don't know either <laughs> I'll say no but I can what I can tell people and you know this for yourself and you're saying it you know in an excellent way but let me add to it too again I have no problem with church I have no problem with anything with certain things of the way people want to heal but this is what I know for me is that if you want to start your life over if you want to overcome pain you're going to have to search inside yourself it's the keys to the inner universe that you're looking for of what's in your own heart and soul now not to um we can go back a couple of shows ago and i had him in a position where i could have said more than i wanted to in other words he talked about religion being his savior and my part of where i see it as it's still when you're looking for something on the external away from you for your happiness you're going to be vulnerable and he was a, an excellent guest and what i was going to challenge him on though is because he likes those uh preachers that talk about making a lot of money right they're called prosperity preachers which they really don't talk anything about religion or the heart and soul it's all about being happy through making a lot of money and what i would add to that is the reason why some people who are drug addicts have more problems is because they get more and more money and they have more and more money to use on their drugs and it always puts them outside of the system always like so yes church can be great it can be excellent to have like-minded people around you it can be very good for the social connection like i said we're wired for that but if you don't look internally about what you need and what you want and who you want to be and you keep putting out everything out there it's just not going to happen for you and that is the the hard or a, the tough medicine to take do you agree mm -hmm. yeah well, I think we all have uh, things that come into our lives, too, and we all have messages. And some people will get what I'm saying and some won't. Right. But I said this to you the other day about something that had happened in, to me, that everything, when you have a feeling, which I would say is discernment. I'll say the word discernment because when you say intuition to people, they go, you're crazy. There's mm -hmm. no such thing. But those of us, and I'm one of those people, that I can get, I'll get little bleeps of information from different sources and I can either choose to, to take it and, and put it over here and hold on to it and go you know what that's a little bit of a some information mm -hmm. and I can take it and I can use it to make another decision or I can throw it away because now I'm afraid of it I don't want to deal with that there there was a, a little clue and I could throw it away and I think a lot of times people they already know like we already know we've had things happen there's little clues along the way that give us little helpers that we can change our lives like if you're around people that are always like at some point you have to realize when you're in a circle of people who's good for you who's not good for you mm -hmm. and you keep making that choice to say you know I really don't feel good when I'm around this certain group of people and yet I still choose them as my friends or I still keep a you know I want to say a client but like I've had hair clients over the years too that I've really felt crappy around that they've made me feel bad about myself as a matter of fact I have a lady that's been calling me for three days now wanting her hair done I did her hair like three times she was abusive to me I didn't like her negative energy I don't think she's a nice person I don't want her in my chair I don't want that kind of energy around me but for some reason she's been around town obviously because mm -hmm. I haven't seen her in over a year and she wants to come back well you know, I have I have the, I could say, yes, I'll take you back and give her another chance to say, you know, to treat me like crap. Or I can say, you know what, I got rid of this person for a reason. Now I need to like, mm -hmm. you know, to stick with it. And there's things that we, or if you don't believe in yourself, you just keep those things around you because you think that you don't deserve to be happy or deserve no stress. You know, I got to a point later in my career that I said, you know what, I don't care how much money you're giving me you're not worth it I would rather be 
at home with my dogs, doing something I want to do, than stand there for three hours and be treated like a piece of crap for a right. couple hundred dollars. It's but, not worth it. But I think part of what you're talking about, too, and is family's that the same way. I've separated myself from some of my family because of that, because they're they're not the kind of... If they were my friend, they wouldn't be my friend, is my point. If, if I had a choice between our families, when we look at our families, we say, well, they're a family. We have to love our family. I love my family. But... I can, I can make a conscious choice. If they were a friend, I would say, I don't want to be your friend because mm -hmm. you're just not, we're not good for each other. Mm -hmm. Our thought process or how we live our lives kind of a thing. And I'm not being judgmental. I'm just, you if you don't make me feel good. good about myself, I don't want to be around that. But I think what you're saying too is that. And that's not external validation. There's mm -hmm. a difference. What I'm saying, because you mentioned before, if you're looking for outside mm -hmm. validation to make you feel good. I'm not saying I'm looking for accolades and people to make me feel good. Right. I'm saying no, I'm I making a choice that. to say this situation makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't feel g comfortable anymore in this setting. So I need to make some changes to get myself a away from that. So the rest of my life that brings me happiness, I can focus mm -hmm. over here and get out of that. No, I understand. But I think part of what you're talking about, though, too, is power, right? Like you are starting to find internal happiness and then you can spread your happiness with other people that you feel comfortable with and so th these are situations that you're seeking mm -hmm. whereas i think before your father died i think you were a totally different person and you would take that client who made you feel bad you would stay with that person who might emotionally abuse you you would do these things but part of our let's say our post-traumatic growth is to stand up for yourself and to know what you want and I, I think you're doing that so you know that's part of it too you see I want to tie in some stuff about what to expect you know when you go through grief in the beginning it's things that some people don't talk about because some of them are wrong by the way if I can tell you my example and Heidi remembers this 10 years ago when I became a widower it was on a Friday and so Saturday, the next week, was the actual funeral, right? So it was Saturday, Sunday, which was June 2nd, June 3rd, and then June 4th was my birthday. So this is how I spent, like, through the holidays, Memorial Day, <laughs> and, and my birthday. It was your wedding anniversary, too. So not, you know, only was it, not only it's was it a death, it was the wedding anniversary and then your birthday a week later. So here's the gift that keeps on giving, okay? Every year there's Memorial Day. <laughs> Every year is my birthday. Every year is all stuck in that section. Now, it's up to me if I want to look at that as being the most horrible part of my life or something that made me make a change. Here's something interesting that uh, people may or may not talk about on a normal basis here, but I remember, okay, I became a widower on a Friday. Saturday, I went to work, and I didn't want to go home afterwards, so I went to the bank first. Here's something very strange. I tried to endorse a check, and I couldn't because I forgot my number. This is an, I have memorized that number for years. And it's just, I couldn't bring myself to remember the number. And I had to say, you know, I'm really sorry, but I <laughs> I don't know my I number. I just had a brain fart, a big one. Well, yeah, and it took me, and then I was like, really, you know, they looked at me, and then, anyway, so that whole thing happened. I went across the street, and I didn't know what to do. This might happen to you. I'm not saying this is a strong move, okay? This is a probably a very weak move, but... Sometimes we're not that strong. I went across the street. That's where Heidi was working. <laughs> she was with a client. And I went in there and I bugged her. Why? Because I wanted to be around another human being that I knew. I could not face opening up my door and going home to an empty house. And so that's what I did. And I forgot. I, you know, I, you don't got, remember I think you got your hair done or something. I don't know. You came in and I was like, what is. Yeah. You probably thought I was the weirdest. Well, guy no, I ever. didn't because I was. I was no, I didn't. I just was. I felt really bad. You know, I remember going to the funeral with Elna and Jonathan. I said, you guys are, you know, they cared about you. But in all honesty, I said, you're coming with me. I don't want this guy thinking anything other than, you know, I care about him. I feel bad for him that he's going through this. Because, you know, I trained with you for over a year when that happened. So yeah, it's not like, longer. you know, I didn't know you as a, you know, some parts of your life. And so I felt really, you know, and I remember being there sitting in the pew. There are pews or were they chairs? 
at the funeral place. It was at the Palm. You're gonna ask me? And I, I just remember, remember I'm sitting with my friend <laughs> my Jonathan, and he's he's there with me. Elna was there, and I had all white on too. That was the other thing. Jonathan was like, I can't believe you're wearing white to a funeral. What the hell is wrong with you? Everybody wears black. So we pull up. Everybody's in black, and I'm in white. Everything I have on is white. I go, well, it's kind of Memorial Day. That's the time of year we bring it. I said, I don't really care. This is not. I mean, I cared, but not. Like, it wasn't about me. So I really didn't care about what I had on. I was like, I'm just there to show face, you know, whatever. And I remember sitting next to Jonathan, and you did the eulogy. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, all I kept thinking was, if I die tomorrow, the person I'm with is sure as hell isn't going to take the time to do all that. They're probably going to throw my ass in a cremation thing and say, see you later, alligator. By the way, that's what my father and, said, too. Right? You know, and I just remember sitting there, and I was holding, and then you made everybody hold hands, and I had to hold oh, Jonathan's hand, that. and I was like, I don't want to hold your hand, Jonathan. But then we held hands. You remember what I said? Yeah, I don't remember all of that. I just remember you said to reach to the person next to you and hold your hand. And I thought, well, how sweet is that that this guy is doing all this crap, this, this not crap, this eulogy, and we're sitting there. And I said, I can't believe, no, I couldn't believe you had it in you because I knew you as a trainer and I knew you were kind of soft and you were you had a, a sensitive side to you. But I was like, holy shit, like where'd that come from? Because it, in the gym, you never was, he was, he's very professional. If a client ever, if anybody ever came up to me and said, Joe was manhandling some girl or he was inappropriate, I would say you got the wrong person because he is just not, he's quiet, he's professional all the time that I know of. So if somebody was to say that to me, I'd be like, you're full of shit, you got the wrong guy because he's just not <laughs> like that. So to see you stand up there in front of those people, do that speech, do that beautiful eulogy for her, I said, well, now that's a really nice human being and that would be somebody I'd want to be with. So I remember going home that day, pissed off, <laughs> and you know, I said no. I, I mean, I had already was filing for divorce. I'd already been to an attorney and everything. And I'm telling you, that was like the icing on the cake for me. So that was a turning point in my life too, because I said not that I necessarily wanted to be with you, but I said if I if there is somebody out there that would be that wonderful to me, I want the opportunity to find them. And if not, I'll just be by myself. I was at that point in that relationship that I was totally okay with being alone with my daughter. Mm -hmm. So that was a turning point. Made that death was a turning point in my life also. But I people, but right? I didn't realize it at the time. You know what I mean? It was like I didn't totally realize it at the time that, you know, that was gonna change my life too in that kind of a way. You know what I mean? I it's yeah, like you're sitting in there. I'm still married. I'm well, still, I'm learning this now, so you know. I'm feeling like I need to say no to all that because I don't like compliments anyway. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, and that was that was it when you had your appendix out too, Jonathan. I dragged him to the hospital, remember, because I was so worried. I was like, I don't want this guy to think I'm up to no good. And, you know, I just said, I just want this on the up and up. I don't want him to be dis... I, don't want, I didn't want you to disrespect me or think I was being disrespectful to you in any way. Yeah, I understand. So I said, you're coming with me. So poor Jonathan got dragged... You, know, you everywhere. make a good point, though, that I need to tell the audience is that, okay, so here's a question that I got this week. Is it good to talk about your problems or about grief to get it out of your system? Right? That's what the question mm -hmm. that comes up a lot. I'm going to tell you the answer is yes, and the answer is no. I had clients. There's no way, you know, there's a statute of limitations, probably like two days that you're allowed to talk to people about something negative they're paying you it's mm -hmm. their time they want to have a good time and they want to get results they don't want to listen to you complain about how horrible of a thing that just happened to you so my answer is is that you have to be very very careful about who you talk to because you're going to lose clients mm -hmm. i did lose clients on top of losing about 50% of my income because of a death, <laughs> and then going to the mailbox later and finding out that there was $25,000 on a credit card that now I owned, that I had to pay off, and there was a lease on a car for like $16,000 that I was on the hook for. So I immediately went into not just grief and loss, but I also panic went into mode. debt. <laughs> <laughs> panic mode. I went into panic and debt. Now. What I did not do at the time, which I should have done, is to find a good therapist to talk to, to get it out of my system so I didn't burden other people that are just not equipped to handle that kind of information. I didn't do that. I kept it all in and I was rewarded by 10 weeks later, my appendix burst and the super tough guy that I think I am, I worked through that whole day and I, I remember feeling the pain in my stomach. 
And then it moved to my right hip. And then I was like, whatever, I'm going to finish my day at work. You trained me that day, that night. I trained you, and I thought, Because I used to train at night. And I'm like, he's hanging on the equipment, and he's, you know, doing this. And he's like, you know, okay. (laughs) I'm like, what's up with him? Are you tired or what? So I waited until my appendix (laughs) burst. (laughs) And you can die from that. Uh, My father, again, coming to the rescue, takes me to the hospital and I was totally wide awake when they were r- basically ran me in on the gurney and they're like strapping me up and I'm looking at all these people and I'm getting ready for surgery and that put me in the hospital for five days and I almost died there so uh, am I gonna blame it on the original loss no that was my fault I need to own that right so I would say yes it's okay to get a therapist but let me be fully honest here of what I know about therapy. They do a lot of things that are wrong to justify their positions and their jobs and to make money. That's the truth of it. There's something out there that uh, they call the five stages of grief. Some people call it the seven stages. It's uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She did the work on it, I believe, 1969. Let me tell you something about that. It's an absolute myth. It's fake. It's a flat-out fraud. What the five stages is that she did her work on, which was amazing work, by the way, it was on if you were told that you were going to die. That is what the five stages are. So I I don't even, like the first thing would be denial. You feeling okay, doctor comes in and says, listen, this is what I see on the chart. It looks like you you have six months to live. You will say, no way, (laughs) right? Denial. But it, it's based on the person who gets the news that they're going to die. It has nothing to do with you losing your partner. So don't even pay one stitch of attention to the, those five stages of grief. It means absolutely nothing. You know, then they try to mix words with it. They go, well, it's not linear, like they used to say. You go from one stage to the second stage to the third stage. Now they say you could bounce back and forth between them. Well, they're saying that because they don't really know, and everybody is different. Mm -hmm. So do you really have to talk about your grief to get over it? The answer is, again, yes and no. Heidi said it before. It's about positive action in the right directions. Talking about it is really not going to do anything. But you indirectly did talk about it. And I'll tell you how, mm-hmm. because we used to meet for coffee and you would read your That's right. pieces of paper to me that you were writing your journaling. And we would have coffee for, we'd sit over there for hours and you'd read and you'd say, what do you think? And I'd say, whatever you think, it's your mm-hmm. writing. It's what's in your heart or what you're feeling. So, I'm, true. okay, so that was a part of your grief was being able to sit and have a coffee with me and you had your book, your book that you wrote, mm-hmm. you're from grief to really you had pieces of paper with you and you would read what you wrote for that week or that day because we didn't see each other every day right you know we only met like once a week or something so that was your way of being able to get to get it out and i and i don't think i really said that much other than you know it's it's you whatever you feel it doesn't matter mm-hmm. what i think if that's good to you it's good to me you know so i think in some cases it's having somebody that you can you know maybe talk to it doesn't have to be a therapist you can mm-hmm. talk about it but then you ha- at some point you have to move through it you have to find a way to Agreed. get into yeah it. um again i'm not an expert on the bible you know but if they say something as i walk through the valley of the shadow of death however they say it it's as they walk through walk through the valley mm-hmm. they don't say buy a condominium in the valley and sit there they don't say you know just hang out in a tent in the valley (laughs) you need to walk through and i think for me without actually knowing it going to a coffee place enjoying that enjoying your company was more than just me sitting there complaining about my life. <laughs> no, I <laughs> you know, know no, but no, I'm no, just saying a, there was a pleasant way for you. Exactly. And it yeah. was a good way for me because I enjoyed your company too and having coffee and listening to you talk and all that. It was a way for both of us because we were both in weird places in our lives that, you know, I was kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing with mine either. Hmm. And it was it was a nice place to be. And I guess my point is, I th- for me, my, my point was my daughter. I remember getting a bang in, upside my head that night in the bathroom saying wait a minute 
okay, you know, you can sit here all night and cry if you want. You can fall apart. You can feel sorry for yourself that things didn't go the way you thought they would go. But you have a three-year-old kid in the in the bedroom right now that is looking to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. So right then and there, it was like, okay, and what would my dad want me to do? Exactly what he told me to do. You take care of yourself and you take care of that baby. And that's the and meaning that was the day the suffering. I yeah. made the, the decision to leave my marriage and everything else when I was in New York was that that night on the toilet <laughs> so that and that's sure. how I honored my dad I said you know what and my daughter my daughter needed a mother she didn't need somebody sitting around on antidepressants getting drunk doing drugs because unfortunately that's what a lot of people turn to exactly. I didn't do that exactly. but I was very sad and depressed and I didn't know what to do and then I was like this kid doesn't need to be around another depressed mm -hmm. person yeah l let me talk to that position for a second too I had some very well-meaning people doctors you know in the gym they'll say well do, do you want some medication my first thought was not thought I said it I said well okay let me think about it do you have a drug that's gonna bring my family back well no okay well then I don't need the drug now do I it, my thought is the drug what it does is it separates you from your pain but you need to be connected with your pain to make a positive result so the longer you're disconnected from your pain, the longer you're gonna to have to take to, to face it again. And so it just prolongs it. So some people like to use the word crutch, right? Drugs are a crutch. They're not. It's an insult to crutches, okay? Because a crutch is used to take weight off of a leg, let's say. And so the leg can repair itself so you can walk again. But using a drug, you will never repair yourself. So drugs are not crutches. It's just another, like a, it's another bullet is what it is. <laughs> it's not a crutch in, in, in any way, shape or form. And I know we don't have about five minutes left. Let me say this too. Again, I've mentioned this last week about other people. If you're not ready for the message, that's okay, right? When, when the student's ready, the teacher will appear. So I'm here. So if you don't like what I say, you're just not ready yet. I believe that inside of all of us, we are the power source, okay? You are the energy source. If you're in a real relationship, a good relationship, a functional, caring relationship, you have happiness inside you, and what you do is you go into a relationship as a place to give things and to give your happiness and to share your happiness with another human being to make their life better. I think we can agree on that. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a relationship and somebody dies, you didn't die, they did. You can still have happiness and love in your heart. And I mention this every week, and thanks Ava for the shirt for my oh, birthday. I was gonna say Hello. happy, his birthday yes. is June 4th. He's gonna be 52 years old, everybody. That's right. <laughs> but but, but let, let me tie this I'm in sorry. here. <laughs> because here's another song. <laughs> Thank you. Here's another song by The Who that moved me at a very young age that was able to help me when I got older. They have a song that nobody really knows about. It's called Love Ain't For Keeping. And that's the point, right? If you have love in your heart, you are a greedy person if you only love yourself. That's called narcissism, right? <laughs> the fact is that if you're a loving human being, you want to spread it to other people. And if you know that, so if you lose somebody, it becomes your job in this universe to be able to still expand and show your love to other people. And for me, it may have been a lot of different things, whether it's actually going back to school so I can help more people, but to do things. It's not about shutting your life down. It's about expanding your life. Because there was a time when I was married when I had mentioned, you know, I'd really like to go back to school. And her thought was, you're very selfish. You, you, why spend money on college when the kids need money for their college? So I'm like, well, it, it made me remember that in any relationship, no matter how good it is, we, we tend to have to make some certain compromises. Well, if you're a loving human being that's always in a growth mode and you lose your partner, you can grow in a lot of different directions. And one of them for me was to say, okay, no more excuses, I'm going back to school. So that's what I did. Heidi, um, I did see you walk into the gym, didn't I? <laughs> and uh, that's how, you know, one of the ways you, you expanded. Agreed? I walked in the gym. Oh, I know. I was like, I walked in the gym every day. 
Well, <laughs> sometimes I walk in a good mood. Sometimes I'd be like, ah, it's five o'clock in the morning. Ah. That oh, was yeah. one of the things about yeah. you starting to care about yourself. Mm-hmm. John, how much time do we have? A minute? A minute. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, just so um, something, a couple little things real quick. In our bedroom, I have a uh, butterflies, like a real picture of a butterfly, like inside this thing. And they're real. They're not, it's not a picture. They were actually real monarch mm-hmm. butterflies. And from an existential point of view, it's always about the act or the art of becoming. So you're never where you are. So you're either becoming worse or you're becoming better. You're becoming smaller or you're becoming more enlightened and bigger. So I have those butterflies on my wall to remind myself every day that it's my choice if I want to sit and be a caterpillar forever or if I want to lock myself into a a cocoon forever or if I want to be a butterfly and expand. The other thing I have on the wall is this right here and I'd like to kind of maybe if we can end the show with this because this is amazing and it's all framed and everything so you know I did pull it off my wall (laughs) to come to the show today. Let me read this real quick. With one minute, this will be perfect. We are not meant to stay wounded. We are supposed to move through our uh, tragedies and challenges and to help each other move through the many painful episodes of our lives. By remaining stuck in the power of our wounds, we block our own transformation. We overlook the greater gifts inherent in our wounds, the strength to overcome them, and the lessons that we are meant to receive through them. Wounds are the means through which we enter the hearts of other people. They are meant to teach us to become compassionate and to become wise. That's by Carolyn Meese, I think. And I think that's everything that we've been saying and that I totally believe in is that, listen, we are going to be wounded. We're going to have grief. We're going to have loss. What do you want to do with it? Help do you want to become people. better? Become better and you can help other people. Absolutely. Get through theirs. So with that, I think we'll end the show. This has been the Rise Above show. I am Joe Peroni. I'm Heidi Mancini. Thank you. <laughs>